Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Showing Up to Life podcast and YouTube channel. I am Art Burns, and I'm really excited to be here with you. I am a certified mindfulness meditation teacher and coach, and uh, I use this podcast and YouTube uh, platform to to convey some ideas and some some thoughts and some uh, concepts, and most importantly, some practices, and, and maybe even more importantly, the, the practices themselves the reasons why we do the practices, right? Because mindfulness is something that we must practice. It's not just something we understand and something we can just sort of like, oh, okay, I got it, let's go. You know, it's something that we need to practice, right? And, and but the really important thing that I want to tell you about is how simple these practices are and, and really how easy they can be. And they're not always easy, Right. And certainly in the beginning, it, it, it takes, you know, some effort and some some um, resolve and some uh, dedication to to, you know, to get to the point where the practices are easy. But I promise you this, the practices are simple from the get go. OK, there is never a point where these practices become complicated. OK, it's 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 amazing. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. And 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 um I want to use the um, the concept of cooking <laughs> to to illustrate what I'm talking about. Okay, now myself, you know, I grew up, and you know, I've shared here, and you can go back and look at previous episodes and stuff. And you know, I had a lot of trauma as a child, right? Did not have a lot of support. You know, my father was not part of my life, and my mother was, um, you know, very much too highly stressed <laughs> to do anything, you know, supportive or or you know, um, encouraging and stuff like that. But anyway. This is not a, a, a cry for art story today. Um, the, the reason I tell you that is because I never learned how to cook, okay, as a child. It was never taught to me. I remember going to a friend's house and they were like, hey, you want to bake a cake? And I was like, what? <laughs> You're going to bake a cake? Like, hey, is that even possible? And sure enough, yeah, you just mix a bunch of stuff in a bowl, you stick it in the oven. We got cake. Like, how did that happen, you know? But then, of course, I would go home and say, hey, mom, can I bake a cake? She said, are you crazy? <laughs> so um, so anyway, again, this is not a, a poor art story, but but it's, it's about, because I've healed from a lot of this, and this is not something, I'm not telling you this story from a place of, of you know, damage and, and, and you know, and, and difficulty where, where saying that kind of thing is going to be a trigger for me, right? I've healed enough that I can speak objectively about this, and, and it feels actually pretty good to, to speak about this. It feels, you know, nourishing in a way. Okay, so please don't don't feel sorry for me. Don't feel sad for me. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> but anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that you know I got to college and you know basically making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich was all I had. You know I had friends in college who had like little hot plates in their room and they were making like quesadillas and then the microwave oven and stuff. And I was like, whoa, you people are cooking, and I never knew any of that. Right. So time went on and I never really had the opportunity to learn to cook, you know, um, aside from like grilled cheese sandwiches on a Grateful Dead tour, you know, in the parking lot. Um, but, you know, making grilled cheese sandwiches literally on a little hibachi grill in the parking lot and selling them for a dollar a piece. You know, that was pretty much the extent of my cooking that and maybe boiling pasta, you know, eventually became something I was able to master. Right. But but it really was not much more than that, honestly. Right. And, and I always had a, a sort of feeling like I wanted to learn how to cook, right? Like I, I wanted to know, like, because it, it seemed like it was really fun to make food and to, and to you know, when I watched people, it, it seemed very satisfying, you know, and it seemed, of course, you know, healthier and fresher and all that stuff instead of going out to the deli and getting a sandwich or going out to a fast food place for a burger and fries, you know, like I would do much better if I could cook for myself. And so I had various girlfriends who, you know, taught me how to like do a stir fry and cook rice and beans and stuff like this. But it all went over my head and in one ear and out the other. And then, of course, I became a father, right? Now, now before I became a father, though, even before that, I remember, you know, once in a while getting like the inspiration to cook something, right? Like, oh, man, I'm going to make that, you know, that dish that I saw in that 
you know, magazine or something like that, right? And so I'd cut out the recipe. I'd go and find all the stuff that I needed. And, you know, so I, of course, I was always picking like, you know, like gumbo or, or like, you know, shepherd's pie or something that was like, you can't find everything you need very easily. So it became this very overwhelming. Even before I got into the kitchen, I was already overwhelmed trying to like, you know, get this whole complex thing going, right? And of course, once I started cooking, it always, always, always became a very um, overwhelming experience, right? And that's and that's how I I came to identify being in the kitchen was with this this stress feeling, right? That that I'm I'm burning things and things are not, you know, they're sticking to the bottom of the pan, and I'm I'm forgetting to put things in, and it's just it's a it's a a, a survival instead of any kind of hobby or anything that I wanted to do for pleasure, right? It was literally try to survive this experience, right? And then, of course, there's always like, how did it come out? And often it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't very positive, right? So now fast forward a few years and, and I'm a father, right? And now, you know, and, and specifically what I want to talk about is what happened during the pandemic, right? During the pandemic, right, cooking became, for me, cooking became a completely different experience, right? My, my wife was, my wife at the time, we're now separated, but, but my wife at the time was, um, was, you know, she was actually working out, in, you know, at, at um, you know, uh, what they call them, essential businesses, right? She was a retail worker. So she was out there in the world every day, which left me at home to tend for the kids, right? Attend to the kids and, and provide for them, right? One of the things I had to provide was food, right? Of course. And, and you know, and, and going out to fast food three times a day was definitely not an option, right? Not for many reasons. I mean, I knew that that wasn't health-wise, it wasn't a positive thing, but but also we couldn't afford it. I mean, it was like literally like, that is not an option, right? And of course, I can't just make spaghetti every <laughs> every meal either, right? So so in other words, I was forced to cook, but but not cooking, and this is the real point that I want to bring up. It's that I was not cooking stuff that required recipes right? We're talking about, you know, scrambled eggs. We're talking about, you know, steamed broccoli. We're talking about, um, you know, all the cooking rice, for instance, right? Like I had never cooked rice before. I mean, not never. It, it had happened here and there. But again, it was always like, oh man, only a little bit of the rice stuck to the bottom of the pot, you know? And it came out okay. Like it's edible. We can eat it. Yeah, win, you know? <laughs> you know? But now all of a sudden, here I am. I have to cook rice like, you know, three times a week for my kids and cook eggs and cook, you know, I made pancakes for crying out loud, right? Only with a mix that you just add water and, you know, it's like this uh, uh, vegan organic stuff that we found that was fairly affordable. It's called Birch Benders, if you're interested. Really, really delicious stuff. Literally, you just mix some water in there, stir it up, and you're cooking pancakes. <laughs> you know, so, so let me not get too ahead of myself. But, but even doing that back in the day, right, would have been difficult, right? Because it's not just about the what the recipe tells you, but it's about knowing how to operate in the kitchen, right? Like knowing, you know, what does five on that dial on the stove really mean, right? How hot really is that? Of course, not measured hot, not, not that I need to know the actual Fahrenheit or Celsius temperature, but, you know, knowing like how, like if it's on five, how quickly is the the egg gonna stick to the pan or the 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 um the rice gonna stick to the bottom of the pot right that kind of stuff right because and and that's my point here right that during the pandemic when i had no choice right but to make this stuff for my kids right again it wasn't that i became you know, a good cook in terms of like, oh, I can make a, you know, poached eggs or I can make a souffle or I can make, you know, this, you know, lava cake or something like that. I mean, that stuff is still way beyond my, my abilities, right? But by learning how to do or, or not learning, but practicing, because I always knew, right? I could look up, a, a, you know, okay, here's how you cook an egg, right? I'm, I'm a smart enough guy. I can read that. I can understand it. 
but yet I always mess it up. So it wasn't understanding it. It wasn't learning it. It was practicing it, right? And now here I am, instead of thinking about this one big meal that's going to take, you know, three hours to make and Saturday night and get people over and stuff like that. It, the cooking at one point was all that big stuff, but now cooking became the really, really little stuff. Making soup for my child, you know, making eggs, making, um, you know, frying up vegan bacon to put on the bagel with cream cheese, you know, this kind of stuff, just the most simple and, and, you know, most of you out there probably, you know, all the people who know how to cook out there are probably like rolling their eyes like, how does this guy not know this stuff, right? But I didn't because I, I was never given the opportunity to, 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 to experience it. Again, it's not about learning. It's about practicing, right? And so by practicing, you know, steaming broccoli, making scrambled eggs, making rice three times a day over and over and over. And again, it's not an, uh, an option here, right? It's not like, oh, well, we'll just go out to dinner instead, right? There is no place to go out to dinner instead. And nobody had money. You know, we were surviving on like this little, little tiny bit of money, you know, hoping not to get everything cut off and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you all remember what that was like. But by doing those little things over and over and over, I became skillful in the kitchen. And I say that because now, hand me whatever recipe you want to hand me, and I will knock it out, <laughs> okay? There's nothing that intimidates me anymore in the kitchen. I am able to, you know, again, my daughter has this one recipe she really loves. It's, um, you know, vegan sausage with gnocchi and, and peppers and onions, and, you know, everything has to be done just right, and it's... it's it's not terribly complicated, but it's not, it's the kind of thing I would have screwed up big time before, but now I can make it without even thinking. Like I'm, I'm like having a conversation while I'm doing this cooking now, right? Whereas before, I mean, the, the smoke alarms would be going off and it was like completely overwhelming. So the point that I'm trying to make here, and I know I'm taking a very long time to get to it, but, but the point that I'm making here is that once we establish a comfort level, a familiarity, a, a, a competency on the smallest scale, that translates into competency on a grander scale. And what do I mean by that specifically? And now let's bridge it over to mindfulness practices. Okay, because, you know, here's the thing. At any given moment, you are are capable or it is available to you to understand yourself and understand the experience that you're having right now and to do so in a way that is, um, you know, an understanding that, that allows for, you know, growth and healing and not reactivity and not anxiety and not depression and not, you know, stress. But instead, th there's an opportunity there to understand ourselves without all that and to understand ourselves on a, on a level that, again, promotes healing and growth and well-being. And here's the thing, you know, like I, you know, I, I've told you all that about a year ago, it's actually, you know, like about, yeah, in about three weeks from now, it'll be a year that my mother passed away, right? And... I can remember now that there's a lot, a lot of stuff there, a lot of stuff. And in addition to all the childhood stuff, you know, there's also this, you know, enormous grief that I feel that, you know, I had become estranged from my mother. And so I never got the chance to say to her anything, right? Like I never, you know, she died while we just hadn't spoken, you know, and that's really, really heavy. I'm, I'm feeling emotional right now, even though I've completely processed all of this, right? And here's the thing, right? Driving back or driving on the way to New York to, to you know, to see her body and to do the funeral and to see all her sisters and brothers and all of it, right? It was 
<laughs> you know, I mean, there was a moment where I actually felt that, you know, and, and I know that it's not true, but not entirely true, but, but I, I, you know, how much did the absence of her son contribute to the, the death, you know, the illness that caused her death, you know? I know it's not none, <laughs> you know? And so there was a very real and visceral feeling on that drive that I was responsible for her death. I caused her death in a very in a very real sense. And let me tell you something. <laughs> okay, that is a very very difficult thing to handle. Right? That's a difficult thing to even sit with and 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 you know, and I'm doing it while I'm driving and I was literally crying like the the it's like a cartoon the tears were like jumping out of my I did have to pull over a few times you know the the tears were jumping out of my eyes and I was literally wailing inside of my car that's how difficult it was but at no point did I feel that I was not safe and that I needed to like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a panic attack. I got to get to a hospital or something like that, right? It was never anything like that. It was, I mean, brutal and, and completely like I'm just along for the ride here and I, I am like way, way beyond any kind of level of control here, right? Because I was facing something that was, I mean, if we're going to, you know, compare this to cooking, it's like some kind of, you know, like, again, like some kind of souffle, right? Where if you, if the oven temperature's off by three degrees, the whole thing's ruined, right? Like that's the level of, of self-awareness and self-reflection that I was experiencing in that moment, right? I mean, really, really, really heavy and difficult, but I was able to do it not because I read some book or I took some, you know, counseling or therapy, you know, my mother died, I got to figure out how to handle it, you know, none of that, not even close, like zero. <laughs> but I was able to handle it. I was able to sit with it and to be with it and to process it, let it process through me in the most painful and ugly and nasty way possible because I had built the skills of checking in with myself over and over and over for, I mean, I've been practicing it for, you know, almost 10 years now, but, but it, uh, it, I was, able to to handle what I handled before it took it didn't take 10 years to get to that point right just like the pandemic was only what a year and a half that we were locked up or something right and so in that year and a half I gained the cooking skills that you know should have been like a whole lifetime to take right and again I I am able to cook the complicated dishes now because I practiced scrambling eggs and cooking rice and steaming broccoli and stir frying vegetables, and doing the most simple things, you know, cutting it up, you know, you know, feeling the spatulas, you know, handling the pots and pans, cleaning everything, right? Practicing cleaning after I cook, because that also was something that was always very overwhelming. It's like I would use every single pot in, in the whole kitchen to make like spaghetti and, and jarred sauce, you know? <laughs> but because I did all those little things, little by little by little by little, in ways that weren't overwhelming. I mean, in the beginning, there's a lot of pressure. It felt like, oh my God, I got to cook. I'm, you know, my, my where's my wife? Ah, right? But... But but because but but very soon it, it, that that faded away very very soon that that feeling of like fear right because again once you do it a couple of times oh wow I didn't burn everything that time nothing stuck to the plate the pan I, I can do this and then doing those little things because again I never tried to make my kids a souffle <laughs> during the pandemic right it was all the most basic basic stuff stuff you could cook while you're camping practically, right? But because I did that over and over and over and over, I came away with a set of skills. Now, does that mean that I know how to handle a souffle? No, I do not. <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to tell you that's a souffle if I saw one, you know? But what I can do is I can with confidence approach a complex 
recipe, like the one that my daughter makes me make with the sausages and the, the vegan sausages, the gnocchi and, the, and everything else, right? Um, I can approach those without fear and with a level of competency because I know that the stuff that, that undergirds that is solid, Right? Like, I know how to boil rice. I know how to steam broccoli. I know how to cut vegetables real quick. I know how to, you know, whatever it is. The basic stuff. And so, again, now this experience that I had with my mother was like, you know, something that, you know, Julia Child would have a hard time cooking, right? If it was an equivalent to a meal, right? You know, you're talking like Martha Stewart, Julia Child, you know, the, the highest levels of, of, of skills, right? Like they would have struggled with the meal that I had to, the quote unquote meal that I had to cook while I was driving home to my, to see my mother in her grave, Right. I mean, it, you know, and again, if somebody had said like, hey, you know, in two years from now, you're going to have to do this whole thing. I'd be like, oh, my, I can't handle that. Are you kidding me? No way. But I can. And I did only because I had those basic little skills. And what are the basic skills? What are the equivalents of scrambling eggs and steaming rice and steaming broccoli in mindfulness practices? That's a great question, right? It's very, very simple. It's just about checking in with what's going on. Now, I'm going to do a, a, another podcast that's going to go into this in a little more depth, and I'm going to try to do this tomorrow. Might even record it today. We'll see. Um, but 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 there are certain ways in which we do this, right? Just like there's a certain way in which you crack eggs into a bowl and you you scramble them up and you you know you preheat the pan and then you drop them in and you do you know there's a certain method that we use for these. But the practices are things that you do like in the in the minutia of the day that you don't even realize you're doing them after a little while. Right. So just the ability to check in and no know, notice what's happening with your body in any given moment. For instance, and I'm going to use this uh, example again tomorrow when I do the recording, but like your feet. Right. There is never a moment in your life where you can't feel your feet. I mean, uh, you know, barring nerve damage and, and, you know, injury and trauma and stuff like that. But, but for 99 percent of the people out there, you know, we can all feel our feet 100 percent of the time. But we only tend to feel our feet when they're hurting at the end of the day. Right. But that doesn't mean that at 11 o'clock in the morning, you could have checked in with your feet. Right. And so so the idea of these practices is, is learning how to do that, how to check in with your body. What is happening in my body right now? Can I feel my feet? Can I feel my butt in the chair as I'm sitting here talking to you? Can I feel into my chest? Do I notice any tension? Is there anything in my throat? Like, is there a, a, a constriction to my throat at all? Do I notice the, the muscles around my eyes? Do I notice any, you know, tension or vibration or twitchiness? Also checking in with my emotions, right? Again, 100% of the time you are having an emotional experience. Now, sometimes that emotional experience might be neutral, right? There's no affectation. That doesn't mean that you're not experiencing emotions. You're just experiencing neutral emotions, <laughs> right? And so at any given time, we can check in. What's going on with my emotions right now? At any given time, I can check in with my thoughts. And specifically, when we talk about the thoughts, what we're really talking about is the sort of you know mental chatter going on. Right. I mean, sure, we can always check in with our thoughts. We can sit here and one of my favorite exercises to do is to, you know, close my eyes and I teach other people to do this. Close your eyes, sit still, imagine that your mind is like an empty room, right? Like a vault. There's just nothing in there. It's just this pure, clean, empty space in which the thoughts arise. OK, now just close your eyes, step back. And watch the thoughts arise, <laughs> right? 
I mean, again, that seems so simple. It seems as simple as measuring out one cup of rice, two and a third cups of water, turning the water on and putting the rice in. It seems that simple. But how many people screw up the pot of rice? And how many people are not able to do that with their thoughts? And again, now we can take that thought process a step further, as I said a moment ago, because those individual thoughts wind up creating that sort of chatter in our mind. Oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you should do this. Or, oh man, your house is so messy. You're such a loser. Oh man, you're, you know, you're such a great guy. The way you, uh, you know, help that person today, everybody should love you. <laughs> you know, all that stuff that goes on, right? I mean, of course, I'm giving you my sort of rendition. I'm not, that's the, the G rated <laughs> version of everything that, you know, there's no, you know, there's nothing harmful there, <laughs> but, but, but the idea though, is that those thoughts are always happening 100% of the time, even while you're sleeping, that's happening. And even while you're sleeping, you're experiencing your body and your emotions as well right? So learning to check in with those things, learning to just notice them, to, to be aware that they are happening, but not aware that, oh, I know my, my thoughts are happening, but do, 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 I'm going through my life. No, no, no. But to, wow, check out the thoughts right now in response to this, you know, traffic jam I'm in. My thoughts are telling me that, that it's my fault. Everything that ever happened in the whole history of the earth is my fault, <laughs> <laughs> because I left five minutes late and I'm stuck in traffic right now, right? Again, it's not, it's the most simple thing we can do. It's like, you know, scrambling eggs or, or you know, frying up a few vegetables or, or steaming a pot of broccoli. Nothing could be easier than steaming broccoli. And that used to be the kind of thing that was like, uh, I don't know how to steam broccoli. Oh my gosh, I got to look it up. I got to have somebody help me. <laughs> Pretty soon, by the way, my son said, you know, I like the way dad does the broccoli better than you, mom. <laughs> she was overcooking it all these years. <laughs> but the idea, though, is that those little tiny skills are the reason I was able to manage that extraordinarily difficult moment heading back to New York. And again, I mean, I was, if, if there was a medical professional watching me, they would have said, we got to put him in a, you know, we got to get him to safety, <laughs> right? Because that's how much it probably looked from the outside that I was completely losing it. I was having like a breakdown, but I wasn't having a breakdown. I was allowing myself to break down so that I could experience the breakdown. I was safe. I wasn't in control. We're never in really in control, but but I was not in any shape of control. But I was in a place of skillfulness. And it's because of those little check-ins. And also, I mean, the most, here's my, my t-shirt. It says, meditation, it's not what you think, <laughs> right? And that's a double entendre, right? Because it's not what everybody thinks meditation is. Meditation is not about, you know, getting some kind of glorious feeling every time and, you know, levitating and all that kind of stuff, right? Meditation is that for some people, but that's not what meditation, broadly speaking, is. Meditation is just an exercise. It's an exercise in which we sit still and we notice our thoughts, our, our attention rather, wandering away from whatever the object of meditation is and recognizing that the attention has wandered and bringing it back. That's as, that's, I mean, tell me that's not as simple as scrambling eggs, <laughs> right? Of course it is. And it's not like I do that once or twice and everything changes. It's something I have to do every day for five, 10 minutes. And then checking in every day for five, 10 minutes, or not five, 10 minutes of checking in, but five, five times during the day, checking in for like 30 seconds or a minute. And as we do this, we develop the skills. And then when something really big comes up, ready, no problem. Give me my apron. I got this. I can handle this. I have confidence. I have comfort. I have skillfulness. And so I hope I'm inspiring some of you to do these practices. 
Because I promise you, you know, again, investing no more than an overall of 10 to 20 minutes a day changes everything and allows you to meet the challenges of life because life is always going to have challenges, right? There's always going to be the death of a loved one. There's always going to be the car accident. There's always going to be the layoff at work. There's always going to be the global pandemic. There's always going to be the, the, you know, the terrible news of school shootings. And there's always going to be, you know, um, uh, you know, misery around us and suffering around us. That's always there. It's always, life is always going to come through with that kind of stuff. So the question is, do we have the skills with which we can manage those things when they come up? Because again, and, and by managing, it doesn't mean like stay calm and regulated. That is absolutely not what I was. <laughs> When I was, uh, and that's not the only time either, right? I'm using that as an example, but I mean, as I told you, my wife and I are going through a, uh, a split. You know, you can bet that there's been some really, really difficult moments in this. And the difference is that the moment doesn't take me and, and trample me and create this chaos in my life. Instead, I ride the, the difficulty like surfing a wave. I'm going to end this podcast with a, a quote from my uh, dear, dear teacher, John Kabat-Zinn, right? Who says, we can't stop the waves, but we can learn to surf. John Kabat-Zinn also says, life is the curriculum. So we do the study, we do the work of our little practices of checking in, doing some meditation, doing some loving kindness and and compassion practices. Again, so simple, simple as steaming broccoli and, and steaming rice. I mean, could not be easier. And as we do this, life then comes as the teacher. Life says, here you go. Here's the death of your mother who, you know, with whom you had an extremely traumatic ex- relationship your whole life. Here it is. Take it away, boy. I'll tell you, if that happened 10 years ago, I would have been drunk for a month. <laughs> no question about it. I would have shown up to the, the funeral drunk, you know, with a bottle of whiskey in my pocket. <laughs> Because I didn't have the skills to handle it. That's, that's the only difference. So again, I hope that I've inspired some of you to, to maybe do some of these practices every day. And if you don't know how to do the practice, or you don't know what the practices are, this is where you reach out to your old pal Art. Okay. Now, my job is a teacher, and so I do have a 12-week program that I can put you through that will take care of all of this. Okay. But... You know, even if that's not something that you're into, let's just, I can give you one or two practices you start with and it could change everything because again, you don't learn to cook the souffle by learning to cook the souffle. You learn to cook the souffle by first learning how to scramble eggs and cook rice and steam broccoli, right? All right, folks, I hope that all helps. I hope you all, that makes sense. Uh, By the way, do me a favor. It's something I'm really, really terrible at. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please hit the like button, okay? It takes two seconds. You could have already done it, okay? Hit the like button, and if you're not already subscribed, subscribe to the channel, all right? Um, This isn't my ego thing, right? It's just it really does help with the the algorithm, right? Like more people will get to see this, and ultimately this is my job, so you'll be helping me, you know, be more successful in my career here, you know, and and uh, and helping more people, right? That's the idea. How many people can I get to help? So so by you liking, subscribing, and perhaps even sharing it with a friend, you will lift us up in that algorithm, getting more eyes on more eyes and ears on this content. Content. And again, you're, you know, that is an act of generosity on your part because by taking that very simple step of liking, subscribing, and sharing, you are now promoting other people or, or you're making it possible that other people could truly benefit from this work. Okay. So, so take a moment and do that, would you? And if you're listening to this on the podcast, Maybe just recommend it to a friend for me, okay? I think there's a way you can give a, a review on uh, on Apple or wherever you see the podcast or listen to the podcast. That would also be fantastic. 
And again, it's all about lifting us up in the, in the algorithm and getting more people to see and hear this stuff so that more people can, you know, get these skills to handle their lives in a way that is harmonious and healing and growing and happy. All right? All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I wish you well, and I'll be back again, if not tomorrow, in the next couple of days. But we're, I'm thinking twice a week is probably what we're going to do here on this, uh, this, this new uh, edition of the, of the uh, Showing Up to Life podcast and YouTube channel. All right, everybody. Thanks again. I wish you well. I'll see you soon. Take care.